started today, let me uh, have a word of prayer. God, I just thank you so much for our time together today, and thank you for this series that we're in. Thank you for Paul's words on how we truly can live with joy and have joy despite what's going on around us, despite our circumstances. And today, uh, it's just a very important message today that we need to understand, that Paul wants us to understand. So uh, give your people, uh, those here, those listening in online, just give us understanding today through your Holy Spirit. Grow us today through your word. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to week five in our Joy Is series, I discovered something this week in my studies. I, I discovered that the Apostle Paul had another secret. Uh, you can call it a key to living. I call it secret. And, and this secret, just like the other two secrets that I mentioned earlier in this series, they go a long way in uh, Paul having, being able to have joy in his life. And, and so the same is true for us. Uh, these two secrets, just like uh, this secret, just like the other two secrets, will go a long way to help us experience joy in our lives. So what was this third secret of Paul's? And it was this. Paul knew where his worth came from. Paul knew where his worth came from. Paul's secret or key was that he knew his value. You could say Paul knew where he stood before God. Even when things were not the best in Paul's life, even when there was an unexpected detour here and there, even when the rough patches came in Paul's life, Paul didn't have to doubt and wonder where he stood with God. He knew how God felt about him. He knew his worth before God hadn't changed despite his circumstances, and that's so important. He knew that God still valued him, and because he knew this, Paul was able to experience joy. Now be honest with me this morning. How important is it to know your worth? Let alone in this life, but let alone, uh, but also in, in, in front of God. How important is that to know our worth before God? To know our value before Him? To know how He feels, our Father feels about us regardless of what we go through in this life? I for one would say that's extremely important. And I would go even further to say that it is vital it's vital for us to understand our worth in order for us to experience joy. And Paul, if there's anybody who knew uh, about uh, worth and trying to get worth outside uh, of saving faith of Jesus, it was Paul. And Paul knew for Christ followers that it, they needed to understand that we needed to understand how we get joy is by knowing our real worth. Paul knew all too well that we as humans, typically, we as humans get our worth and our value where? From work, from what we do. Uh, we have to produce. We have to perform. For instance, think about this with me. In your jobs, maybe you're retired, but think back to when you were working or you're working right now. How did you get your worth in your job? How many attaboys, good jobs, did you have to have to feel worthy? How, how about the raise? How big of a raise did you need in your job to feel that you were valued? How many promotions did you need to know that you mattered? Uh, in the world of professional sports, we see this all the time about the performance. There's probably no better example uh, of a person's worth being connected to their performance than sports world. Think about it with me. In most contracts, most athletes have contracts, there's something in there called a performance clause, an incentive clause. Now, what do you think that's about? It's about this. If they score so many touchdowns or score so many goals, uh, or if they make the uh, all-star team or the all-pro team, they're going to get a bonus, a sizable bonus uh, from doing that, from their performance. Most coaches, uh, Coach Cow, in his contract, as well as most coaches, they have this performance clause, this incentive clause. For instance, if a coach leads their teams to the playoffs, to the Sweet 16, or to the championship game, they're going to be paid substantially for doing that, for their performance. We, we see this performance and worth thing in our jobs. We see it in the sports world. And unfortunately, we even see this performance worth thing within the family. Now think about this with me. How did you feel your worth in your family? This doesn't go for everybody, but there's a lot of people, I bet, that, uh, that lived this performance worth thing within their families. A lot of time was your worth not connected uh, to what you did, to your performance. For instance, if you scored enough points or made enough goals, did you feel that you gained more love, more worth in your family? If you got all A's or you, you made the got the scholarship or you won the spelling bee, did you feel your value increase within your family? 
Uh, guys, if you got the big job or the big house, did you feel that your dad would love you more and, and you'd have more worth within your family? Let me go a completely different way here. Maybe you uh, were always living in the shadow of a successful older brother or older sister. What if you were always uh, trying to live up to what they did? You, you talk about not feeling worthy, not feeling valued. You saw your parents dish out and beam over pride and dish out compliments on that, on that older brother or older sister, but yet you're thinking, I want some of that. Where's mine? You looked at their, they looked at their accomplishments and it left you out. So church, do you see this subject of worth? It's huge. It affects us in almost every part of our lives. And I think you can easily see why the Apostle Paul makes it a point of reference in so many of his writings. Paul knew the way the world and culture attached their worth to their performance. But he also knew how easily Christ followers could easily fall into that trap, that same trap. And as I said, Paul knew better than anyone that even Christ followers could be tempted in the same way to look at their worth in God's eyes through their performance. So Paul wanted his readers to understand this. Your performance never changes your worth to God. Now, read those words. Let those words sink in. Digest that thought. Nothing you do today could ever make God love you more than he does this very second. And for a lot of Christians, that statement is something that uh, they would balk at. Right now, as I just said those words, you may be tensing up because that runs counter to how you were raised. If you're honest with me, maybe some of you sitting here and listening in today were taught just the opposite of what I just said. You were taught it is all about the performance. You were taught it is all about the externals. You were taught it's about church attendance. It's about tithing. It's about taking communion. It's about serving. It's about not hanging around uh, the bad people. As I've told you before, that was my world. That's the world that I grew up in, the environment that I grew up in. I grew up thinking my worth to God was all about the externals, about what I did, the performance. And do you understand what I mean when I use that word, performance? I'm talking about a performance-based faith. When your faith is directly related to what you do, I found a, a quote this week from Mark DeJesus. He's an author and teacher, and he, I think he explains this performance-based th performance faith thing very well. He says this. It says it's your identity. It's when your identity, your sense of love, your validation and affirmation is based on what you do and how well that you do it. Now, this definition to me is a perfect definition of, of a, how the Pharisees viewed life. The Pharisees, for them, it was all about what they did and how well they did it. And Paul's saying, no, that's not it. That's not it. And just let me clarify something for you. I believe all those things that I just mentioned, I believe that we should come to church out of our love for God and what he's done for us. I believe that we should give him our tithes and our offerings. I believe that we should serve for him. But understand this, none of those things in the end have anything to do with my worth to God. None of those things make me any more or less valuable to him. He, he could not love me more than he loves me right now. And you're, you, maybe you're saying to yourself, well, Craig, how do you know this? Well, I know this for two things. Because I'm a father, I'm a dad, and I'm a grandfather. On the pictures that you see, this is, these are my two daughters, Kayla and Ann. Do you think Kayla and Ann have to perform for me so I will love them? You think they have to do anything for me because uh, I will give them more of my love? These are my grandkids, Emmy, Tate, Elijah, and Evie. The same for them. Do you think that they have to jump through hoops for me so that I will love them more? Question is, could they do anything else to make me love them more? No. No. And if that's true for us as parents and grandparents, because I know you feel the same way about your kids and grandkids, then why would we look at God in a different way? Why would it be any different for God? Man, he looks at us and he just has love for us. But maybe you need further proof of this than that example. Let me give you further proof. Look what Isaiah said. Isaiah said, all our righteous acts, all our performance, all our good deeds are what? Filthy rags. Isaiah said, they're just filthy rags. 
Need more proof? Paul's words to Romans, Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What do we have to do? Nothing. We weren't living for God. And look what he said. Christ still came and died for us. When we were apart from him, when we couldn't give a rip about what Jesus did for us, God still sent Jesus for us. So understand today our worth and our value come only from a God who, who sent his one and only son into this dark world so that we could live in relationship with him and spend eternity with him. Do you understand your worth? That's your worth today. Jesus said, this is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one would need be destroyed. So please hear me today. This is where your worth comes from. And because of that fact, you can experience joy. This is where our joy comes from. Knowing our value, knowing our worth to our Heavenly Father. Man, that just gives me joy as I think about that. And I believe that this is Paul's whole point in, in Philippians 3 of what he writes here. Know your real worth. No, it's not about your performance. Because evidently, by what Paul writes here in chapter 3... There were some troublemakers, Judaizers in Philippi, who were trying to get these Gentile Christians to concentrate on the performance part instead of on what Jesus had already done for them. These troublemakers were putting the focus on the externals. Look at Paul's words to the Christians in Philippi. And don't miss the fact that he was just a little bit upset as he writes these words. Paul says this. He says, watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say, you must be circumcised to be saved. I don't think Paul holds back here in how he really feels about these guys that are spreading this false truth. Uh, I think you get a pretty good glimpse of how deep this issue runs with the Apostle Paul. Look again at what he calls these Judaizers. He calls them dogs. This is a term of contempt. You know, in actuality, I think it's a racial slur back at that time. He calls them evil. Uh, this is, uh, he calls them evil because of what these Judaizers, these troublemakers are doing, what they're spreading. Uh, basically, evil means that they're immoral and they're wicked. Pretty strong language. Uh, but think about this with me for a moment. The Pharisees, they lived, uh, they lived a good life. They did good deeds. But yet Paul calls their deeds evil because their sole trust was in what they did and not in what Jesus had done for them. And then mutilators. Probably the strongest term in that verse that Paul uses. Paul says basically they're just maim artists. All they're doing is just cutting up the flesh. There's no purpose to what they're doing. Church, do you understand the problem? Do you understand why Paul hits on this subject of performance in almost every single one of his epistles? It's because he wants you and I to know and his readers to know beyond a shadow of a doubt salvation is not based on our performance. We are only made right through God, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Wasn't that Paul's exact words, really, to Titus when he wrote to Titus? Look what he said. Paul said, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, not because of our performance, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And because of His grace, He declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Because of His grace, not because of our performance. Paul wanted us to know our real worth, your real worth, is in and only in Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Philippians 3.3, 3, he says this, For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us, and we put no confidence in human effort. Let's break down what Paul said there. He lists four different things. For we who worship by the Spirit of God. I'm reminded in Galatians where Paul writes about the Galatian church and the Christians there. They once started with the Spirit, and then they started going to what the flesh could do. Paul writes this. He says, You foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Who has tricked you? Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, by your performance, or by believing what you heard? 
Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Even these Christians who had been Christians for a while, they were changing back because they believed the, the lie. Paul said, we worship by the Spirit of God. Paul said also, we are the ones who are truly circumcised. Paul's point is, it's not just a physical change, but it's a heart change. It's an internal change. And we live with that heart. Paul says, we rely on what Christ has done. That word rely means to trust with confidence. We don't rely on our past and what we've done in our past, but we only rely on what Christ has done for us. And then finally, Paul says, we put no confidence in the flesh. As I mentioned earlier, our human nature, is it not to base what we do on our human work ethic, on our effort? Paul's reminding us again here, don't do it. Don't believe that lie. Don't let others tell you to do it either. Trust in Jesus' saving grace. Paul's reminding the Philippian Christians here that where real joy is found. And man, if you, if you do this, if you think of the Pharisee's life and what they did. Think of the work that was involved in that. Think of trying to follow the law of the Old Testament. It had to be so frustrating that I can't believe there would be any joy found there. Paul's saying don't fall for this performance-based faith. Paul's saying it's nothing but fake news. You're never going to experience true joy by doing what these guys are telling you to do. And I love this. To drive home his point, what does Paul do? He, he uses himself as example A. Look what Paul says. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could. I mean, I, I'm pr I was pretty good. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. Paul says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. A real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who, who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. Man, if there was ever anyone who knew all too well there's no joy in performance-based faith, it was Paul. You know, Paul, think about it. You talk about a performer. Paul used to be a performer. He was up there at the top of the list. Paul says this, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I was circumcised at the same time that Jesus was circumcised, when all Israelites were supposed to be circumcised. Paul says, I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel. My, my lineage, my family line, it goes way back, all the way back to Jacob and, and to Abraham. He says, I'm a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. He says, I'm a member uh, of the Pharisees. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. Now think of the Apostle Paul. Who was there as they were stoning Stephen? Where did the people leave their garments when they stoned Stephen? At the feet of Saul. And what was Paul on his way to do in Acts chapter 9 when, when, he, got his, uh, when he had his conversion on the road to Damascus? Paul, if you read that, he was on his way to persecute and arrest Christians. Paul says, man, I was zealous. I was zealous. I harshly persecuted the church. And then he says, as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. And doesn't mean, he, he's not talking that he was sinless, but he just said, man, if there was a law to obey, I wanted to obey it. But look, look, Broadway, look at what Paul says about his past performance. He says this, I once thought. You know, so much of a Christian's life, so much of our lives is being able to change our thinking. Right? From what we were taught, again, everything we were taught was not wrong. But everything we were taught also was not right. And so being able to learn new things. Paul, being a Pharisee, think of what he knew in his life. He says, I once thought these things were valuable. The performance was all that there was. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous 
through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Let me close out today and ask you this question. What are you about in your life? Are you about the performance? Has that been what it's been about for you? Are you about the externals? Is it, is it in those things where you feel your worth and your value before God? If so, let me remind you again what Paul said. Listen to his words again. I once thought these things were important. These things were valuable. These things made me of worth to God. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. He says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. What value did Paul say he put on the externals now that he has the saving grace of Jesus? He said they're worthless. Worthless. Paul said, I consider these things, the external things, they're garbage. You know what that word really means? <laughs> One translation, it's dung. It's dung. Paul says, I consider it just dung. Paul wanted us to understand the foundation. This foundation was not on external things. The foundations need to be on Jesus and what he had done for them. And so what did Paul value now? Now that he understood that, where did he find his worth? For what did Paul live for now? In verse 10, chapter 3, he says this, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. That was Paul's heart's desire. Paul was done with focusing on his status, his past performance, his past accomplishments, his past spiritual heritage. Paul lived with a single focus in his life, to know Jesus. That word is gnosko in the Greek. And it means to personally, intimately, and experientially know something or someone. Paul was more, wanted to know more than just the facts about Jesus. Paul wanted to know more than just uh, what Jesus taught. Paul wanted to experience Jesus. He wanted to experience the power of knowing Jesus. That same power that we can know in our lives. Paul says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. What was Paul talking about there with knowing Jesus? Charles Spurgeon, I think, reads something that I really like. Let me read it to you about knowing Jesus. They tell me he is a refiner that he cleanses from spots. He has washed me in his precious blood, and to that extent, I know him. They tell me that he clothes the naked. He hath covered me with a garment of righteousness, and to that extent, I know him. They tell me that he is a breaker and that he breaks fetters or breaks chains. He has set my soul at liberty and therefore I know him. They tell me that he is a king and that he reigns over sin. He has subdued my enemies beneath his feet and I know him in that character. They tell me he is a shepherd. I know him for I am his sheep. They say he is a door. I have entered in through him and I know him as that door. They say he is my food. My spirit feeds on him as the bread of heaven. And therefore, I know him as such. Do you want to know true joy in your life? Give up the performance. Give up depending on the externals. Quit trying to earn God's favor because you already have it. Set out in your life to truly know Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, I just thank you so much for just Paul's words today. Father, I, uh, I just thank you for what we've learned about him so far and what we continue to learn about him and how he was able to experience joy. And today, Lord, as we talked about, he, he knew joy because he knew his worth. And so many people I, I know in life, even later in life, they're still trying to get your worth. They're still trying to earn your favor. God, I, I'm one of them at times. Help us to understand, God, our worth, our value to you can never be more than, than what we are this very second. When you've been taught a different way, it's hard to comprehend sometimes. But God, I just pray that you would just continue to help us to immerse ourselves in your word and allow your spirit 
to be able to say these words. I once thought those things, but now I know, just like Paul. Thank you for your, the words today. Grow us today. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.